God's given me a message for today. It's an interesting message. It's a different message. If you'll join me this afternoon in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Oh, yes. How many Christians love to go to the book of Deuteronomy? Especially when wanting to criticize and condemn LGBT people. Deuteronomy, the 19th chapter this afternoon, Deuteronomy 19. We're going to read verses 15 through verse 21. Deuteronomy 19, verses 15 through 21. Deuteronomy 19, verses 15 through 21. And the King James text today reads, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. If any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you, and those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Excuse me. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me a moment today? Jesus, Master, Savior, soon coming King. We thank you, God, for the word of the Lord. We thank you, God, today for the sacred script which you have allowed to be uh, placed within our hands that we might hold the promises and the precepts of God within our grasp, that we might look upon the page and in ink and paper we might see that Lord which you have committed yourself to and that which you have called us to. The time has come for the preached word of God and oh Lord I know, I know, I know that I can not possibly deliver a word to the people of God today without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need you Lord to touch me I need you to touch my mind. I need you to free me, God, today from every distraction, everything, Lord, that would strive to combat and battle with my thinking, that I might focus, Lord, that I might submit myself to you as a willing vessel and you might be able to speak to the people of God through me. Help me, Lord, at this hour to deliver unto your people that word which you've given me for this hour and this moment in time and help every hearer God to be receptive 
This is such an important message for this time. Help us to receive it, Lord, with gladness. Let it be good seed that falls upon good ground. And let that seed spring up, O God, and bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. I've titled my message today in such a simplistic way. I don't think you could be any more to the point than I am being today. I've titled it simply, Tell the Truth. Tell the Truth. The primary text that I've read to you today, Deuteronomy 19, verses 15 through 21, I read to you from the King James text. And right now I would like to read that same passage to you once again, but this time I want to use the English Standard Version. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a, cha a charge be established. If a malicious witness arise, arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. What evil are they speaking of? Lying. Lying. God does not appreciate lying. God does not appreciate particularly a false witness. Therefore, the Lord says, if someone falsely accuses his neighbor or his brother of some sin or some offense, and you discover that that person is falsely accusing them, then you are to do to the false accuser what would have been done to the person. So if I'm accusing you, for instance, of homosexuality, and, and supposedly you're supposed to be stoned to death, uh, if you're convicted, well then uh, that means the person who lies must be stoned to death. The fate that he was or she was trying to visit upon the other must be visited upon them. Isn't it funny, Tommy, the Jehovah's Witnesses love to call people into their little tribunals. They love to call people in and say, oh, the Bible said two or three witnesses, bless God, blah, 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 blah. And they have their little tribunal. But if they find that the person is falsely accusing or if they find that there's no substantiation for the accusation, do they disfellowship the person? Do they shun the person who brought the accusation? No, they do not. Isn't it funny how they are so careful to follow the Bible only to a point? Isn't it funny how people just love to embrace the Word of God only to a point? Why, bless God, we're going to call ourselves biblical purists. We're going to call ourselves doing what the Bible says to do uh, to a point. Because we're not going to do everything it says to do. We're just going to do so much of what it says. We're only going to go so far as we're comfortable. Hello now. Uh, that's not how it works, folks. Now, I want to remind you, this that we're reading,
reign today is within the confines of the Old Testament law. This is no longer binding upon the New Testament church per se. The Word of God still teaches us that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The Word of God still tells us not to receive accusation against a brother, except, excuse me, against an elder, except in the presence of two or three witnesses. So the, the principle in this still stands true. However, this is within the confines of the law. I am not preaching this today as a law. I am preaching this today uh, in the manner that it is meant to be preached. The Word of God telling us that the Old Testament contains types and shadows. There are still lessons for us to learn from the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that you apply this in a legalistic fashion. But there is some Thing to be learned from this passage today and what is to be learned I'll tell you what there is to be learned you need to tell the truth God does not abide liars God does not abide false accusation God is not pleased at any level it's so funny how people can get up in their churches they can preach against the homosexual they can preach against the drunkard they can preach against the prostitute but isn't it funny that in very few churches today you hear a single word preached about liars and lying no it's in the Ten Commandments it's one of if I might say it this way it's one of the top ten sins in Exodus 20 verse 16 the ninth commandment reads thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor an earlier commandment told us thou shalt not lie lying and bearing false witness are not acceptable within the kingdom of God. They are not acceptable within the confines of righteous behavior. In Proverbs 6 verses 16 through 19, and I'm going to read this from the uh, English Standard Version as well for clarity. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord among brothers. In Proverbs 19 and verse 5, the Word of God declares, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. In Proverbs 19 and verse 9, the Word of God declares, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. You know, Christians are so funny. I know people that'll just you know, trying to put forth this image of righteousness and holiness, they'll act like they can't say anything that's even remotely untrue, anything that is even the slightest bit not factual. For instance, how, how many times does someone come to us and, and they show us their new coat and it's just the ugliest coat you ever looked at? Or they show us their baby and that baby looks like something that was born to an alien dad and an earthly mom. 
And they say, oh, isn't it beautiful? Don't you just love, how do you like my coat? Or isn't my baby beautiful? And you look at that thing and you, you jump back a little bit. And you want to scream, dear Jesus, deliver us, God. But you don't. And how many of us will say, oh, yes, why, he's just adorable. Or, oh, yes, sister, that's a lovely coat. That's very nice. Yes. Hello now. How many of us do this? Well, of course, most of us do. You don't want to hurt people's feelings. You don't want to be malicious. Well, I've got news for you. That is not what the Word of God is talking about when it refers to lying. When it talks about lying, it refers to speaking an untruth that will visit harm or injury upon another. When you lie to someone to defraud them, when you lie to someone to cheat them in business, when you lie to someone in order to get something out of them, when you tell someone you have feelings for them just because you want sex, but in fact you really don't. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? All of that is a lie that is displeasing to God. There is a difference between saying something that is not altogether factual, but you say it in an effort to not bring harm and not cause pain and not injure another person. And when you say something with the exact opposite intent, do you follow what I'm telling you? But God does not like lying. God does not appreciate the liar. We live in a world today where I have never in my life seen lying embraced so readily by so many. We have a man in the White House who for four years has been lying and lying and lying and lying and lying and lying. And, lying. and everything he touches, every person he touches becomes a liar just like him. In order to enable him, in order to support him, in order to advance his goals and his efforts, everybody that crawls into bed with him has to lie just like he does. And these people believe they are Christians. These people believe they are going to stand before God and they will be unscathed. They will be untouched by the judgment of God. And I've got news for you today. That is not so. God has declared that the liar will perish. Am I telling the truth now? I'm here to tell you folks, you better be real careful about what you say about other people. There's a reason why gossip is not acceptable in the kingdom of God. Because gossip often is an accusation that is not based on fact, but rather on hearsay. Got news for you folks. We got people in our church world today who are running around saying that uh, homosexuals should be gathered up in America and stoned to death. They should be gathered up and killed because after all, that's what the word of God said that should be done. Baloney, you're a liar. You're bearing false witness. You're not telling the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. There are a lot of LGBT people in the church world today who live under a cloud of uh, guilt and shame and condemnation because they do not understand the truth about how these sorts of matters were handled within the confines of the law. We read today God's mandate concerning how any accusation concerning any sin or any breaking of God's divine law was to be handled. And God said you must have at least two or three eyewitnesses. If you do not have two or three eyewitnesses, don't even hear the matter. You're not even supposed to hear the matter. 
You're not even supposed to bring it before the judges until you have two or three eyewitnesses. You remember the story of the woman who was brought before the Lord and cast at his feet. And the Jews of his day, the leaders in the synagogue said, this woman was found committing adultery. She was caught in the very act. And the law says she must be stoned. Well, that tells you right there that she had to have been committing the carnal act of adultery. She had to either be married and was having sex with a man who was not her husband, or she was having sex with a man who was already married. And there had to have been at least two or three witnesses to this. They had to see the act being committed wasn't based on rumor, wasn't based on hearsay, wasn't based on I heard a noise through the wall. No, they had to be actual physical eyewitnesses to the infraction. And they cast her at the Lord's feet and said, the law says, because the conditions had been fully met. I've got news for you. I've researched this matter over the last several years. And do you know that stoning in ancient Israel was actually done on very, very, very rare occasion? They did not do this frequently. They did not do this often. Well, for one thing, a man could go down the middle of the street in Jerusalem and he could say I just murdered my neighbor I just killed my neighbor I just stoned him to death because I was mad at him and guess what you couldn't do a thing in the world to him didn't matter that he said this because the truth of the matter is God had provided not only the law but he also had provided the means whereby the law was to be carried out and the means whereby the law was to be carried out said that there had to be two or three witnesses to the actual sin, to the actual event. This is why there's a woman at the well who talks with Jesus. And the Lord says to her, go and get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. I'm living with a man, but he is not my husband. Now, wait a minute. In the puritanical uh, society that was ancient Israel, how could a woman possibly live with a man who was not her husband and not be dragged out into the street and stoned for committing fornication? How is that possible? Think about it for a minute. You see, people don't like to think. We, we got people in the church today dumb as rocks. They don't want to waste any energy thinking, God forbid, I do that. But think about it for a moment. She is confessing to Jesus a great sin. Why aren't you afraid he's going to pick up rocks and start to stone you? No, because that's not how it works. I can confess this to anybody I want to confess. I can tell it to everybody in town. I can let everybody in my city know what I'm doing. It don't matter. If they are not in my bedroom seeing me engage in carnality and carnal, uh, you know, interaction with the man I'm living with, then... Uh, Anything I say is null and void. It means nothing. There has to be two or three witnesses. And you cannot lie in wait. In other words, you can't set a trap. You cannot hide in order to catch somebody doing it. No. What God was basically telling the people of Israel was this. If you're going to do wrong, then you'd better do it in such a manner that it is out of sight. Don't do it in the middle of the street. Don't be having sex in public parks. Hello now. Don't be doing things out at uh at kissing point in your car. Hello now. Don't be engaging in carnal activities 
at the drive-in movie theater. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why? Because doing so, you open yourself up to the possibility that two or three people might walk by and see, and then you can be properly accused and convicted, and whatever the uh, punishment for that crime may be, it can be brought upon you. So therefore, God said, if you're going to do something that I've told you not to do, you'd best keep it private. You'd best keep it out of view. This was one way that he kept the best possible examples before the people, and he prevented the worst examples from being placed in front of their eyes. Do you understand what I'm saying today? We live in a world today where, my God Almighty, we've got television shows and movies and all this, and... Uh, the worst possible examples of morality and decency and proper conduct are displayed before us constantly, aren't we? We constantly see people jumping in and out of bed with, you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry that walks down the street. We constantly see people doing things that are contrary to biblical morality and godliness. And uh, God said, no, 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 I don't want that going on. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? I don't want that going on. If people are going to be sleeping around, if people are going to be catting around, if people are going to be whoring around, that's all well and good, but they best keep it private. We don't need this out setting an example for the children and setting an example for the community. Do you follow what I'm saying today? I'm going to tell you, there is something to be said for what's done in private stays in private. There's something to be said for the old word we used to use years ago was propriety. Meaning, there are some things that are proper for this setting, but they're not proper for this setting. The sexual revolution told us that anything you do in private, anything you say in private, uh, has you have every right in the world to broadcast it in public. Well, that may be the doctrine of the, the sexual revolution, but that is not the doctrine of the Christian church. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. In Exodus 23 and verse 1, the word of God said, Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Ooh, boy, the White House spokesperson is in trouble today. Put not your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Just because he's telling lies, don't you cooperate and don't you enable. Don't you go out there and start repeating his lies. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm going to tell you, folks, people better be careful. God has told us to tell the truth, to speak the truth, to be truthful. I'm going to tell you, years ago when our ministry in New York City had a Apostolic Learning Center in Brooklyn, New York, and we had a library there, we had a bookstore, and we had a coffee shop all in one, and it was rather popular. We did very well with it. We had a number of videos that were created by different fundamentalist and evangelical organizations that dealt with cults and the teachings of cults and uh, practices of various cults, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, so on and so forth, Scientology, things of this nature. And every once in a while I'd be watching these videos and I would see them say something and I would see them represent something a certain way. And I knew that the way they were representing it, Tommy, was not intellectually honest. I knew that they were kind of twisting and perverting things a little bit in order to try to make it look a little worse than it was. Now, that didn't make the organization or the religion 
uh, right or not a cult. It was still a cult, and there were still any number of things that were wrong. However, the particular point they were making was not a legitimate point. They were bearing false witness. They were twisting and perverting facts to make it work for their argument. And I saw this, and I'm going to tell you a little secret. It repulsed me. It offended me. It bothered me. I don't like that. Don't do that. Because no matter how you slice it, my friend, you will answer for a false witness. You will answer for a false report. You will answer for telling a lie. Because God does not approve of telling a lie. God does not approve of bearing false witness. We have preachers that get up into pulpits and claim today that homosexuality, for instance, is akin to bestiality and child molestation. And these people not only do this, but they also do this. Is that so? And how many of these people have you witnessed doing these things? I don't have to witness it. I'm looking at statistics. Oh, really? Yes, so if one person, if you read of one case where a gay or lesbian individual, for instance, uh, raped or a gay or lesbian person molested something or someone, all of a sudden that applies to all gay lesbian people, and you don't perceive that as bearing false witness. Well, I got news for you. Ted Bundy murdered a whole bunch of men. And he was a white man, and uh, so I assume then that all white men are multiple murderers. It must be true. Am I telling the truth? It has to be so, because after all, I know the statistics. Hello now. You see, you've got to be very careful. We've got all kinds of idiotic uh, theories and all kinds of idiotic conspiracies running around in our society today and Christians are foolishly believing all these conspiracies and all these theories even though none of them have been met by the biblical test how do you know this to be so how do you know there are Democrats who worship Satan that are involved in a child molestation ring uh, have you seen them worshiping Satan? Have you seen them molesting children? If you haven't, where are the two or three witnesses that you have who have physically seen this happening? Where are they? The Word of God tells us that as children of God, we're to love. We're to love our neighbor as ourself. The Word of God tells us how love is defined and how love is manifested. And I've got news for you in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The Word of God tells us that love, charity, thinketh no evil, is not puffed up, vaunteth not itself. Thinketh no evil. I'm going to tell you, when somebody comes to me and tries to tell me something nasty about somebody, I don't just jump on it like a lion on a lamb and, oh, because I want to believe that so, I'm willing to devour. No, 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 no. No. You know, the best Christian people I've ever met in my life, the sweetest Christian people I've ever met in my life, the most godly Christian people that I've ever known were people, Tommy, who... You couldn't make them believe anything bad about anybody. All they ever saw, even in the most sinful person, even in someone they knew, was not a Christian, was not saved, was not born again. Even someone they knew had very serious issues in their life with which they disagreed. Maybe they had a drinking problem. Maybe they had a drug problem. Maybe they had, uh, maybe they were homosexual, whatever the case might be. And yet these Christian people, if you were to speak to them about that person, do you know what they would talk to you about? They would talk to you about the good in that person. 
Well, but you know, he's an awful good fellow. Bless his heart, I'll tell you. If it weren't for the drinking, he, he's a marvelous person. You've heard me talk about my grandfather. I loved my grandfather on my mom's side. He had a lot of faults. He had a lot of issues. He was a hard man to deal with at many, many levels. But you know what? There was an awful lot of good in my grandfather. I saw that good. Because you cannot love like Jesus loved without looking past the bad to find the good. If there's any phrase that disgusts me, it is the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. Honey, you've got to, in order to love the sinner, you have got to learn to ignore the sin. Do you want everybody in your life trying to ferret out and dig out your sin? Do you want everybody in your life to focus on your weaknesses, on the negative things in your life? Do you want everybody you know to focus on your failings, your faults, your weaknesses, your sin? No, of course not. You hope that they will look past that and see the good in you. Then why in the world do you think you are justified in looking at other people's sins as you perceive them? And allowing that to affect how you treat them or how you act toward them. No, that is not acceptable. In order to love the sinner, I've got to ignore the sin. I've got to look past the sin. Do you know what my Bible said? My Bible said that perfect love, listen to me now, covereth a multitude of sin. When you love like Jesus, look at who Jesus hung out with. Do you think Jesus could have dinner with people? Do you think the Lord could share company with people that were sinners, people who were known to have all kinds of faults and failings? Do you think the Lord could have uh, made himself available to all these people if he focused on their sin? No, of course not. Of course not. But we have people in the church world today who feel fully justified in looking at everyone else's faults and failures, everyone else's fractures. I want to tell you today, my friend, listen to me when I tell you, tell the truth. It is not acceptable to lie. It is not acceptable to bear false witness against your neighbor. In Proverbs, uh, 12 and verse 17, the word of God declares, He that speaketh truth showeth forth forgiveness. Excuse me, righteousness. I don't know where in the world I come up with forgiveness. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. In Proverbs 14 and 5, a faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. In Proverbs 21 and verse 28, the King James Version says, A false witness shall perish, but the man that heareth speaketh constantly. Now in order to help you understand that better, let me read it to you from the NIV, the New International Version. A false witness will perish, but a careful listener will testify successfully. Why will a careful listener testify successfully? Because they're not going to repeat false facts. They paid attention. They were listening. When someone said something to them, they're not going to tell you, Oh, he said this. If I had a nickel for every time, I've had somebody walk away and tell somebody else, Well, Pastor Charles said thus and so, and I never said those words a day in my life. I never spoke those words 
that may be what they heard, but the only reason it's what they heard is because they were not listening. Hello now. They were not paying attention. They were not being a careful listener. No, they heard something I said in, the, in their own mind. They twisted it. They perverted it until they made it into something else. Am I telling the truth? I remember years ago when I was engaged to be married to a woman many years ago. And her mother knew that there was a little bit of an issue between this preacher at this church and I. And uh, I, I had discerned some things concerning him that deeply troubled me. And uh, anyway, I, 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 I was uncomfortable with him. Let's put it that way. Well, when I'd be off preaching somewhere, she'd be going to that church, and then she'd come back to me and she'd say, Oh, brother so-and-so said, So where's Chuck today? And I said, Oh, really? Now, Tommy, just because she sent it to me that way, I did not, just because I wasn't crazy about the man, I did not immediately assume she was speaking truthfully. Do you follow what I'm saying? No, the way she repeated it back to me may not, I doubt highly, was the way he said it. The way she said it sounded as if he was being sarcastic. He was being mean-spirited, right? But in reality, he may have said, oh, so where's Chuck today? Do you follow what I'm saying? All you got to do is change the way you say something in order to change how what you're saying is perceived. You can bear false witness simply by changing the way in which something was said. So there are people that go and say, oh, the pastor said thus and so. Pastor didn't say thus and so. Pastor said thus and so. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you see the difference? It's all about the spirit and the attitude with which it is said. In Matthew 15, verses 16 through 20, And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand whosoever in, whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drought. Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from, uh, forth from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's something a lot bigger to tell them the truth than simply breaking a law or breaking a commandment. No, if we don't speak the truth, if we don't speak honestly, if we don't bear a truthful and honest witness, then we are defiling ourselves. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Because it's not about what we eat. It's not so much about what we do or who we do it with or how we do it. But it's about what proceeds from us. And if we are willing to allow false witness to pour forth from us, if we're willing to allow lies to come out of our mouths, we are defiling ourselves in the process because it's what comes out of us that defiles us, not so much what goes in. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? I know this is a strange message today, but we've been living in a time when lying has become so common and so many today are falling victim to these lies. Adolf Hitler said, Make the lie big. He said, don't, don't lie little tiny small lies. He said, no, that doesn't do anything. He said, make the lie big. 
And then repeat it and repeat it and repeat it because the more you repeat it, the more people will believe it. We just had thousands of people in Washington, D.C. Seizing, uh, 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 seizing upon the Capitol all because they heard a lie, a big lie, and that big lie was repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, and there were others who entered in, what did the Word of God say about entering in with a righteous man, an unrighteous man, hello now, a wicked man? We had others who went in with this guy to help perpetrate the same lie, and these people believed it. Did they ever see any evidence to that effect? No. Did they ever hear any eyewitnesses to that effect? No. We've had experts. We've had authorities. We've had state officials. We've had voting officials. We've had governors. We've had secretaries of state. We've had all kinds of people testify that the vote was legitimate. The count was legitimate. Many of them were Republicans and they said, this isn't even the outcome that I wanted, but it is the outcome that we received. And, and my job is to report on the actual legitimate outcome. And yet there are millions of so-called Christians who refuse to believe this because they would rather believe a lie because the lie supports what they want to believe. Well, I got news for you folks. There were millions of people, and this preacher right here is among them, who in 2016 believed with all their heart that Donald Trump won the Electoral College through nothing less than some form of trickery or some form of uh, chicanery. I believed that. I kept hoping that every legal means for him not entering the White House would be uh, accomplished. There were very few avenues after the vote is counted and after uh, the Electoral College vote has been counted. There are very few avenues. I know how American government works. I understand. I, I've studied it, so I know how it works. I'm not stupid enough to think that a vice president can change the count when they're reading and reporting the state's uh, count in Congress, I know that that is not possible. That is not within his his uh, constitutional powers and his constitutional abilities. But we had thousands of people seizing upon the Capitol believing he could because someone lied and told them that he could. No, he could not. He had no authority under the, in the universe. If that were possible, come on people, for God's sakes, use your head a minute. If that were possible, then any sitting president over the last 200 years could have guaranteed that only his party continued to win every election after he left office. If it were possible for the sitting vice president, the incumbent, if it were possible for him to affect the election in that way, then every single election could have been won consistently by the same party using this same tactic over and over and over again. Obviously, if the vice president had that within his power, it would completely destroy, completely destroy the American system of democracy. There, there'd be no fairness to it whatsoever if one man had it within his power to say, oh no, I don't believe that state's vote. I don't believe what they've certified as their uh, uh, electoral tally. Good heavens, people, why in the world can people not use their brains, Tommy? Why can people not use their heads? No, 
The system is set up in such a way that at the time that Congress receives the validated votes from the states, all they are there to do is to open the votes, to read the votes, and ultimately to officially certify and declare the winner. The winner's already been chosen. That, that, and that's not going to change. Tell the truth, people. How many of us today have fallen victim to lies? How many of us today have fallen victim to untruths when God has taught us to speak the truth, but not only to speak the truth, but to hear the truth. Lastly, today in Romans 13 and verse 9, Paul writes, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The word of God tells me that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. All liars, not some, not most. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Anything that is spoken that is untrue, that is spoken with the intent of deceiving, with the intent of damaging or harming another, is a lie. Am I telling the truth today? Bearing false witness, speaking an accusation against others that is untrue, is something that God does not accept, He does not approve of. He has commanded us to tell the truth. Gossip, you know, I'm going to tell you, and I am closing. Gossip is a damaging, damning thing. You want to see people destroyed, all you got to do is start gossiping about people. We've got the internet now where people just think nothing of getting on the internet and saying any old thing they want to say about other people and what have you. You better be careful about this, folks. Because I've got news for you today. Lying and false witness is no more acceptable in the church today than it was in Israel of yesterday. God has commanded us to tell the truth. I know this was a simple message and I know I feel like I was very disconnected and discombobbled today. So I apologize for that. But I hope that you've received something from this. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Mm -hmm.